you know, I read you, your article with great interest. And I think a, a lot of people actually um, around the, the world, um, because we are in the midst of this Russian invasion of Ukraine, are worried about the, the what next, um, what next for Ukraine, but also potentially what next for the rest of the world and, and countries potentially helping Ukraine. So you wrote the you wrote this piece and I mean I was uh, uh, when I was sort of researching today in the last few days and I, and I won't list all of the countries but the EU said it was going to give 500 million to Ukraine in arms and aid Germany is going to send 1000 anti tank weapons Netherlands is going to send 400 rocket propelled grenades Estonia is going to send stuff uh, France is going to send defensive weapons the US as as sort of put together a 350 million package of weapons in a way all together there's about 20 countries in total belonging to nato belonging to the eu or not belonging to any of these bodies that are one way or another providing assistance to ukraine so the question really is because it's russia because it's putin is also mentioned you know nuclear rep- weapons um at one, at what point, in a way, do these countries stop being neutral? And at one point, Russia could actually attack these countries. So there is, in a way, the question of what does international law says about this? But but could I mean, reality often is different from international law. So I'd like to hear your your view about this. Well, I think all these countries are not neutral anymore, and and they haven't been in the first place. I mean, all countries member of NATO are not neutral. So if you belong to a military alliance, you are not neutral. I mean, you can say that Finland perhaps is neutral because it's not part of NATO, but part of the European Union. And then even that could be questioned. It's not a military alliance, but anyway. Switzerland, of course, is neutral. But when Switzerland decided a few days ago to join the sanctions, it was exactly the point that they actually leaving the neutrality. So um, all countries which are either part of a military alliance or which are joining um, the sanctions or which are even the uh, 141 countries who voted in favor of the General Assembly resolution, Frank. I mean, they all voted condemning Russia as an aggressor. So they are no longer neutral in, in the in the you know in the in the literal sense of the term. I mean of course then we can have different grades of neutrality and of course it's a big difference between saying I'm against this invasion and sending weapons and at the next step even uh, taking part in the conflict, you know, like that would be the next step. So and that's actually the discussion you have in the international law when is um, your participation um, giving the other party, Russia in this case, a right to strike back. And, and uh, of course, most people would say um, uh, that uh, uh, the, in this specific situation where you are acting within the Charter, Article 51, the collective self-defense, and now when, when, when I wrote this, we didn't have the General Assembly resolution. We have even now a better basis. Um, I didn't read the resolution as such, but I imagine that the resolution also says something like doing something against this war, and that that then gives another empowers countries, authorizes countries also to to send weapons. So I would say in the result that the uh, Article 51 collective self-defense system overrides the violation of neutrality. <clears throat> So you mean that um, this Article 51 overrides, so which which is about uh, collective action to to stop a war, overrides being neutral or not being neutral in a way, right? But yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. these are two uh, uh, regimes, if you want, you know, two legal regimes: the, the old law of neutrality from the 19th century um, and the new post Second World War charter system, a system of collective defense. And Article 51 is just an expression of the self-defense right, a codified expression. But you could say that as in individual relations, if you are attacked by someone in your house, you, of course, have a right to self-defense. And your neighbor could help you (laughs) under the Belgian law, criminal law, of course, 
could have you. And, 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 and this is this idea of collective self-defense in international law that these states, and that's what Article 51 says. It says states can assist um, the state, um, the attack state, and therefore that's quite clear cut that you have this um, this right. And then the question is, what's the relationship between this right to help, in this case, Ukraine, uh, and the neutrality? And I think then, in this case, clearly the right to self-defense is prevailing, you know. So in a way, you, you're saying that under international law and international principles, mm -hmm. Russia couldn't reuse really assistance to Ukraine as an excuse in a way to then retaliate against any of the countries we, we've talked about, right? Yes, and, 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 and it cannot retaliate in a military manner. I mean, that's, that's another debate. How can they retaliate? I mean, reprisals, countermeasures. I mean, of course, if, if you are object of sanctions, like, you know, what Russia did, for example, they closed the Russian airspace for us as we closed it for them. So that's a kind of countermeasure. And, and of course, you can, you can say, if we, are, if we are right here, I mean, you know, this is such a David and Goliath situation. That's such an easy case. I mean, it's, it's very rare in international law. Maybe we could discuss the Iraq invasion by the United States. That would be more interesting. And, and or Kosovo, you know, where you have not such a clear-cut situation. Um, of an invasion which has no basis, except you, except you accept the argument that there is a genocide going on of Kiev against all Eastern Ukraine. And so, um, as to the countermeasure, there are levels. Certainly, Russia cannot go beyond the charter, and it cannot militarily react. I mean, it could not, um, for example, strike militarily against these states as long as they are not directly involved in the conflict. If what has been said by some, uh, like the Swedish airspace was violated these days, you heard perhaps. If the Swedish airspace is violated, then you could consider this as a violation of Article 5 of the NATO agreement, and then the NATO could strike back, and then we, we would be in a full-fledged war. Nobody wants this, and this escalation is, 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 is actually the danger, and therefore I would say I'm very critical, of course, of Western double moral in, in other things, but here I think the West has reacted very proportional and reasonable in the sense that they always said, and Biden said it from the start, that they will not militarily get involved directly, you know. And so I think, I, I, I wouldn't think that this is uh, something which gives Russia the, the right to strike back militarily. <clears throat> So you're saying when, when you say states um, don't have a direct involvement, by direct involvement, I guess you mean what, sending troops or what does direct involvement yes. mean? I mean, you could, you could of course, if, if you listen to Ukraine, they would like, they would love to have NATO soldiers on the ground. You know, I mean, you could say in, in terms of the, I mean, if you think through self-defense, I mean, if you are attacked in your house right now, we are doing this interview, someone comes in from this window behind you, and you, of course, could shoot this person if this person threatens you. So you could use violence. And, and your neighbor could enter your, your, your apartment to help you. And so if, if Russian soldiers are on Ukrainian territory, um, self-defense, of course, could imply that NATO soldiers, if we accept self-defense as a concept, that NATO soldiers help Ukrainian soldiers in a situation where you have a clear, clear inferiority of, of, of Ukraine militarily speaking, you know. And, and so this is this may, may be legally possible. That's another debate. Um, but um, it is it, as, as far as you only only send weapons, um, uh, you, are, you are not directly involved. You have no soldiers on the ground or you don't train the Ukrainian soldiers right now, you know. <clears throat> so there's something I'd like to talk about because we've been talking about international law, international humanitarian law, but these type of conflicts and wars, don't they, what, I mean, what they show the most is actually the limitations of international law and international humanitarian law in actually avoiding or ending wars? Yes, I mean, uh, of course, this is actually the debate. We, we also have this underlying debate of the powerlessness of power of international law. And, 
And I just read a paper by two scholars and, and one very critical scholar on, on this and this double discourse, this hypocritical moves of the West. And we have two codes if you want. I mean, some states, powerful states, violate international law. That has traditionally been the case. And the United States is one of them, of course. Now we have a multipolar world where there is no hegemonic power, but we have Russia, we have China, we have India, and of course China will always wa also violate in the Southeast Chinese Sea with Taiwan, and and Russia does uh, what United States has done before in Iraq, for example. Um, and the, the the other code would be we all go with the institution, we use the mechanisms we have, United Nations. So we can criticize that United Nations is a kind of archaic thing in the Security Council. You have these five powers, you know, imagine France, you know, a kind of regional power, still a permanent member. On the other hand, you do not have Brazil, you do not have India, South Africa as permanent member. So it doesn't represent the uh, power situation of the world of the 21st century, but this is still the mechanism we have. And if we go for the institutional mechanism, if everybody would go through this mechanism, including the West, then, of course, we would be in a better situation. And the Russian argument, the, the long prepared argument, Kosovo, uh, Ukraine, and so on, of course, um, there is some, some truth in it, but it doesn't give them the right to do the same. I mean, you wouldn't, you, you, you wouldn't say that, you know, if, um, if, um, if your neighbor killed uh, a friend of yours, you can kill your neighbor. I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, do, you don't, you know, you don't compensate injustice with another injustice, you know. And, and again, sort of staying on this point, uh, I think what people have to understand is when we talk about international humanitarian law, we're talking about laws of war, right? Um, should we shift the focus to laws of peace, potentially? Yeah, it's... Uh... I mean, it's it's we we talk about uh, we, we talk about the rules in armed conflicts, and of course we have the law of peace, which is this kind of parallel system. And the um, threshold is the dividing line is when do we have an armed conflict? You know, which which is a dif difficult issue. If you think, for example, of Palestine, Israel, and other conflicts where it's not so clear cut, as again in this situation where another state invades, so it's really like a German Nazi invasion. You know, this is what happens here. So that's such a clear, even war in a traditional sense, an international conflict. And um, the the use at Bellum, so the right to wage war, is this red line. You know, when do you cross it? And when do we have a right? I mean, you could have a right. Of course, it's not excluded that you have a right. You know, I mean, if, if for example, this preemptive strike theory, if let, let's take the, the Polish in 1939, of course, they would have... if. They knew, I mean, the Germans want to invade Poland, and then Poland could have strike, strike first, you know. I mean, that, that was really preemptive strike. And so we, we of course, have situations where, where, where countries can, in a kind of preemptive or preventive self-defense, react. Um, so, so these two regimes uh, apply, but the, the law of armed conflict is not a bad law in this sense. It just accepts that we have armed conflicts. You know, only if, if you believe in a world without violence, which unfortunately is counterfactual, you know, in, in private relations in, in our cities, you know, so, so what do we do then? And then you better have rules for the violence, you know, than no rules, you know. Thank you, Kai. Uh, finally, I'd like to, uh, I know you're not a visionary, uh, mm. you know, you are, uh, but um, Anyway, what's your, your what's your gut feeling? You know, in what could happen potentially in the next few days? Could we could we find a way out of this crisis soon? Um, could it escalate a lot more? Uh, any any thoughts on this would be amazing. Yes, I mean that that's really very very difficult. I mean, first of all, I think that the the reaction of the West, uh, including the other states which are part of this General Assembly, 141 states has an impact on Russia. If you have seen the Rus Russian ambassador to the United Nations yesterday, if you go to YouTube and you see him, he was really shocked. I mean, he didn't expect that they, they get only five states against. And look who, I mean, North Korea and so on. I mean, uh, Syria, you know, so, so um, 
I think this is an impact, a polit political impact, and also the economic impact with the sanctions. So maybe there is some movement internally with the oligarchs. So who, who could actually change things is the economic power in Russia. So they could put pressure on Putin, and 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 maybe we don't know what happens behind the scenes. And and also this may be the reason that they negotiate. Also they they do not really give a, a chance for 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 a solution with, with these kind of maximum uh, proposals uh, maximum things but i think uh, the, the chance we have and that has to do with the sanction regime which affects really russian oligarchs the russian government and has an economic impact that internally despite the the the, the oppression of the of, of 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 the civil society we there may be pressure by powerful groups in Russia. And I cannot believe that Putin is alone. You know, I mean, it's, it's even even in in such a powerful person like Putin, there must be other powerful persons still in Russia who, who can have can have an impact on him. Oh, sorry. Finally, I've got I've got another question. NATO. I mean, it's I think it's it's crucial to talk about NATO. It doesn't mean you know being playing devil's advocate or something but but nato has a role to play in what's happening now in ukraine right i mean putin has started the war has invaded and is primarily responsible but the role that nato has played over the last two decades is something we should talk about because i feel now nato is actually being empowered when nato should potentially have been dismantled in 1991 so so what's your opinion on this and that would be my final question <laughs> I mean, not really dismantled. I mean, what we of course have discussed in 1991, 90, 90, this kind of informal discussion with the German government, Baker and, and Gorbachev, NATO will not expand. Uh, but it, of course, the, the Russians accepted that East Germany will be part of NATO if we have reunification. But then of course you have an expansion. But here the issue is, and I'm that's an imperial question. What do you do if, if states like now Georgia after this invasion, or Finland. No, not sure if you heard the, the last uh, news from Finland and now the Finnish may think of NATO uh, accession, which is directly a border country with Russia. Or look at Georgia, which did not join the sanctions. They voted in favor of the General Assembly resolution, but they didn't want to, you know, to spoil the relations with a big neighbor and they didn't directly go to the church. But now they, so actually Russia, empowered, as you say, strengthened NATO. So the appeal of NATO is bigger now. And the question really is, what do you do if a country wants to join NATO? I mean, this also self-determination. Then you can only say, well, that's a manipulation, at, like the left in Germany said a long time. Until now, they changed their view. When the invasion happened, the whole left in Germany changed. But before they said, you know, NATO manipulates Ukraine. So that is also kind of paternalistic thinking. I mean, if if you have a people of 30 million and these strong people, you know, resisting Russia, why, why don't you give them credit? I mean, they could actually truly believe they want to be in NATO. What do you do then? You cannot say, well, we are a closed shop. Of course, Germany always said you should not join NATO because this will, um, uh, uh, will not be good for our relation with Russia. I understand the point. But now Russia, since it invaded, made a strategic error. I mean, I think that was a bad calculation of, of Putin or of, of anybody because this reaction strengthens NATO in the end. And in the end, perhaps, we don't know, Frank, maybe in five years we have a stronger NATO, more countries in NATO, more Eastern countries, you know. Many thanks, Guy, for these um, 20 minutes. Very uh, helpful and enlightening. Thank you very much for the interview. and. Have a good time. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.